So it's an incredible honor for me, a financial economist, to be here with uh, all of you today amongst the uh, amazing biomedical expertise that's in this room. Uh, and behalf of uh, all the uh, patients and their loved ones, thank you for doing what you do uh, for the rest of us. So why am I here? Um, I'm not a biomedical expert by any means. Uh, I'm not even a healthcare economist. I'm a financial economist by training and trade. Much of my career has been devoted in applying mathematical and statistical models to investment problems, risk management, hedge fund strategies, and so on. I got interested in healthcare for personal reasons about 15 years ago, friends and family dealing with various kinds of cancer. And through that process, I learned that finance actually has a pretty big role to play in drug development. And so that's what I've been doing for the last 15 years or so, applying some of the knowledge that I've developed in finance and applying it to biomedical innovation. So what I'm gonna focus on today is not the process of developing drugs, which is what we've been talking about to a large degree yesterday and today, but rather, how do we pay for all of them? And so I'd like to talk a bit about that, but before doing so, I'd like to set the stage. And the stage is that we are living through a very unusual period, a period of extraordinary biomedical innovation, an inflection point. Now, how do I know that? Uh, well, because my colleagues, uh, Susan Hockfield, Tyler Jackson, and Phil Sharp told me so. Uh, in 2016, they published a paper on convergence, the convergence of life sciences, physical sciences, and engineering. And it's through that process that we have all of the amazing things that we've been talking about over the last couple of days. And I'd like to give one particular example that all of you know as well, if not better than I do, and that's gene therapy. And I'm gonna start with uh, a couple of examples. So this first example has to do with these two kids, Caroline and Cole Carper. They were born with a disease known as Leber's congenital amaurosis. It's a rare condition, a single gene mutation that causes blindness starting at birth. So by the time you're six months old, you're pretty much legally blind. And in 2016, they were part of a clinical trial by a company in Philadelphia called Spark Therapeutics, a, a, a gene therapy that took the correct version of the gene, inserted it into a viral vector, an AAV9, and a one-time injection to the back of the eye allowed the defective gene to be replaced by the working copy. And a few weeks after this one-time treatment, this is what Caroline had to say. I went outside when it was snowing and I was like, oh, I can see the snowflakes. It was really cool to actually see something that I've never seen in my life before. The second example has to do with a company called Agilis Biotherapeutics a company that was uh, just a few blocks away from my MIT office, and I was introduced to them a few years ago. Um, and generally, when I'm introduced to a biotech company, that's, that's not good news for the biotech company. It means that they're having trouble raising money. And so I wrote a case study about them. They were working on a really remarkable therapy for a disease known as aromatic L-amino acid decarboxylase deficiency. It took me an afternoon to figure out how to pronounce that. It's a single gene mutation as well, and this particular mutation prevents your brain from producing an important neurotransmitter, dopamine. And without it, you can't engage in normal bodily functions like movement. And so a Taiwanese doctor by the name of Paul Hu figured out that you can use gene therapy as well, and a one-time injection to the brain of an infant that's diagnosed with AADC deficiency would replace the defective gene with a working copy, and presto, dopamine starts being produced. So I'm gonna show you a video clip, 30 second video clip, of a clinical trial for patient number four. It's a child that was diagnosed at two years and five months with this particular disorder. And so you're gonna see the child before the gene therapy, before this one-time injection, and then that same child a year later, and then two years later. So here's the baseline, and you can see that the child really can't move can't lift his arms up by himself, can't roll over, can't lift his head up, needs a breathing tube, and this is pretty much the rest of his life. That same child, one year later, after this one-time injection. Now, he's moving, crawling, doing what a, a normal infant would do. He's obviously delayed, because he hasn't been producing dopamine until fairly recently, and he can stand, but he not, can't quite stand on his own. And you watch him here, he's gonna be balancing and he'll eventually have to be caught because he'll fall. Now this is two years later, that same child, 
is moving much better, making progress. Not yet quite walking normally. We don't really know whether he'll ever walk normally since he hasn't gotten dopamine since um, until he was two years and five months. But this is an extraordinary feat of modern medicine, thanks to those of you who are in the room and involved in this. The blind shall see, the lame shall walk. You know, that's a phrase that comes out of religious texts, miracles, but it's happening now, today, thanks to the work that you're all doing. And so one by one, diseases like Leber's congenital amaurosis, spinal muscular atrophy, leukemia, certain forms of other deficiencies, one by one are being cured by gene and cell therapies. It's extraordinary. But it comes at a cost. In particular, the treatment costs of that gene therapy for blindness, 475,000 per eye. For spinal muscular atrophy, $2.1 million. And recently, a gene therapy for hemophilia was announced. That is the most expensive drug in the history of the pharmaceutical industry, $3.5 million. Can we afford these therapies? Now, granted, these are for relatively rare conditions, but turns out that there are about 200 gene therapies in late-stage clinical trials, some of them targeting much more common diseases like macular degeneration, and soon we expect to have a gene therapy for sickle cell, which is not a rare condition. So this is not a minor issue. This is gonna be a serious and growing problem. Well, how do we pay for these right now? Turns out that there's a thing called reinsurance to help regular insurance afford these extremely expensive therapies. And let me show you how it works. Imagine you are part of a health plan. Let's say it's a company that's got 1,000 employees. We get most of our health insurance from where we work. And at 1,000 employees, you're typically self-insured. That means you're not part of any larger health plan. You're paying for expenses out of your own corporate budget. And with 1,000 people, that's roughly about $6 million for a healthcare budget. And so obviously what this company is concerned about is if there is even one patient in that company that needs a gene therapy, that could wipe out a significant portion of that budget. And this might not seem like a big deal to you because you're here at MIT and, and you're part of other large organizations, but it turns out that half of all insurance dollars are paid for by self-insured plans like this little company here. And so what do they do? Well, they engage in reinsurance. They can't afford to take the risk of having a single patient in their portfolio, in their, in their uh, workforce. And so what they'll do is they'll pay money to a third party, a reinsurer, and in exchange for that reinsurance premium, they will be able to offload the risk to the reinsurer so that if a patient does need that therapy in their company, that the reinsurer will pay money to the drug manufacturer to provide that. Now the problem with this picture is that currently, for a variety of reasons, both regulatory, structural, and competitive, it's very expensive to purchase this, sometimes costing about 800% of the actuarial fair value of the insurance. And so for most of these smaller self-insured companies, it's not affordable. Uh, and even if it were, there are all sorts of challenges in getting it covered. For example, the reinsurer will tell the company, well, maybe you know, your worker can try some of the cheaper chronic therapies first before we pay for gene therapy. Let's wait and see how that patient does over the course of a year or two, when, when in fact you know that that will often cause deterioration and sometimes irreparable damage. And so you get into this really unfortunate dynamic where the company is pitted against the patient and the provider. It's not a good situation. There's got to be a better way. And there is. There is a model known as subscriptions or the Netflix model. And uh, the Netflix model works like this. You have the same company looking for reinsurance, but instead of purchasing reinsurance from a reinsurer, you will purchase it from a cheaper source of reinsurance. In fact, what is the cheapest source of reinsurance in the entire healthcare ecosystem? Does anybody know? Once I figured this out, I, I, I kicked myself because it's just so obvious. <laughs> no, but <laughs> good try. The cheapest reinsurer in this entire system 
is the drug manufacturer. It's the company that's producing the gene therapy. Why? Because they're the ones that make it. So if you get any other third party that was gonna purchase it on behalf of one of the patients in the company, where are they gonna get it from? They're gonna get it from the drug manufacturer. And so a subscription model would work like this. What you would do is pay a subscription fee for every single member of your workforce, maybe 10 cents per member per month, and you pay that not to a reinsurer, but to the drug manufacturer, let's say Novartis in the case of Zolgensma for spinal muscular atrophy. You pay Novartis a certain amount per member per month, a subscription fee. And in exchange for that subscription fee, Novartis agrees to treat every patient in your population that needs the gene therapy. And that per member per month fee is set at the actuarial fair value of that particular treatment. Now, this has a number of benefits over standard reinsurance. First, as I said, it's the lowest cost possible. There is nobody that's gonna undercut Novartis because they can provide it at production cost. Second, there is no debate now about whether patients should get treated or whether they should wait because you've already paid one price, a subscription fee, and it's kind of like an all-you-can-eat buffet. Once you pay for the all-you-can-eat buffet, you will eat all you can eat, even though you shouldn't. In this case, every single patient that needs to be treated in this company will get the therapy. It is in the incentive of the company to identify every single patient and get them treated, and Novartis is perfectly happy with that because they're getting more patients, they're seeing their subscriptions used, and that will justify the premiums that are getting paid. And by the way, what does Novartis get out of all this in addition to the actuarial fair value? What they get is a much smoother stream of cash flows. Instead of getting lumpy $2.1 million checks every time they identify a patient, what they get is on the day of approval, as soon as the subscription model is put in place, they start getting cash flows every month. So it converts a lumpy payment into something that is much smoother, and if you know anything about Wall Street like I do, you know that you will get brownie points for smoother earnings. And finally, the other benefit is that you can do this not just for Novartis, but for all the other drug manufacturers. You obviously need a company to do this. You need a Netflix to actually calculate the premiums, but you can offer one-stop shopping for all of these employers that have the potential patients and give them a list of the gene therapies that are covered for a single fee, a subscription fee to that entire list. And then Netflix basically takes the money and distributes it across the different drug manufacturers. What this effectively will do is to give you that mythical state of nirvana that healthcare economists have been talking about ad nauseum for the last several decades. That is a single payer system. Not for everything, but it'll be a single payer system for gene therapies, which is the most efficient form of reinsurance because you're spreading the risk over the largest possible patient population. Pretty cool, right? So is it practical? Well, I'm happy to report that a couple of years ago, I co-founded a startup with um, Yu Tong Sun, an entrepreneur who used to be the head of data science at Oscar Health, a healthcare payer, who understands the healthcare system intimately. And we founded Quantile Health to basically be this Netflix model, to be able to calculate the actuarial fair value of various different diseases and gene therapies. And so far, Yu Tong has recruited about a number of health plans to the tune of four million lives covered. And she's now in the process of engaging with biotech and pharma companies to run a pilot program later this year, early next year. And fortunately, Medicare has actually changed the guidelines to allow these subscription models to be used. So all the stars are aligned, and hopefully within another six to 12 months, we'll actually see an example of this. So let me summarize by pointing out that you know, finance doesn't always have to be a zero-sum game if we don't let it. Those of us who are in the financial industry, we should remember that for most people outside of that industry, finance is a means to an end, not an end unto itself. And with the right kind of financing at the right scale, it is possible to, to achieve 
that, that mythical state of being able to do well by doing good. <laughs> Thank you.